fans, welcome back to another episode of Slashcast. My name is Riley, and joining me today is James Hugh Courtney, the brand new Michael Myers in the new Halloween. Uh, first of all, James, happy Halloween, and thank you for joining me. Yeah, happy Halloween. Glad to be here, man. Yeah, conveniently enough, we've been trying to schedule this for a long time. Uh, but your schedule is so insane, including uh, a ton of conventions, H40 event that just happened. I mean, what is, what is that like for you? I mean, jumping into this huge franchise and being welcomed with open arms. Oh, man, it's, it's, it's incredible. I had no idea really what I was going to experience. But, um, you know, H40 was, I mean, it was, it was just wall to wall. I mean, between meeting the fans, then panels, then photo ops and I mean, I literally had a handler just ushering me from place to place to place to place. Didn't have time to eat. Didn't. I mean, it was just crazy. But it was really beautiful because the fans were so stoked and they were so excited. And so, like, moment to moment, I get to meet another fan who was really, really just overjoyed. And I got to share in that joy. And so it was such a high, man. It was such an incredible high. Yeah, I, I can't imagine. You, you did tell me that you were uh, traveling with Carpenter at one point. Well, um, I, that was the, the deal we were supposed to, uh, but John Carpenter ended up being in, um, in Europe. So I went to Bowling Green, Kentucky, where he's from, and I, it was my understanding that we were supposed to be there together, but uh, he ended up staying in Europe, so I made the appearance at the uh, Skeleton's Lair uh, hunt up there, and it was, that was a blast, too. It was, it was an awesome time. Yeah. Now, it's got to be a pretty surreal with an opening like Halloween just had. I mean, it's got to be surreal being in the film in general, but having an opening that uh, damn near broke the October record, but then it's breaking a bunch of records, uh, including records with the the oldest or uh, highest grossing film with a uh, female lead over 55 years old. I mean, what, what is that like, how, how, taking all that in and just realizing how successful the film is? You know, man, um, surreal is a great word because it's really, um, I mean, intellectually, I can look at this, this information and go, wow, that's really cool. But I, I, I can't really, I, I, I can't really tell you what that means to me. You know, it's just, it's, it's kind of a dream, and I'm keeping such an insane pace right now that I don't really have time to sit and think about it. You know, I don't have the time. To, I haven't had the time to like really let this wash over. I mean, I've been flying here and flying there, and you know, interviews and podcasts and da 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 da. da. I mean, it's just, it's just insane the pace I've kept. So I think maybe, you know, come to the end of the year, December, like around the holidays, maybe I'll be able to like sit down and reflect on what this all means. I, yeah, I mean, I can, even having like a small community is surreal to me. Uh, having millions and millions of people seeing you on the screen is, I, I just couldn't even imagine that position. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I, I, yeah, I, I, again, it's just, and, and, and the, the character and all the work I did was so non-intellectual. Anyhow, I think this whole space of doing Halloween, playing Michael Myers, you know, being the shape, is just such a non-intellectual place for me that um, that I've I'm kind of this is an entirely new experience on every level. And now, just out of curiosity, were you a, a big fan of the films beforehand, or I mean, at least the original, specifically the original, uh, before going into the role at all? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, I saw um, I saw the original, and you know, there's two films in that era that really, really struck me. I mean, I knew I was going to make films in fourth grade, so I've been an avid film goer. The only time I don't go to films is when I'm writing because I don't want to be influenced. But so when I saw uh, Rocky, when when I saw the original Halloween, both of those were game changers, man. I just knew I knew right away when I saw the original Halloween that it was a game changer. It's like okay, this is a whole new paradigm. And like, how did you go about actually like uh, getting the role? I think the the last film you did beforehand, at least in terms of your IMDb, was the the gray in between, which is back in 2002. Uh, just kind of curious how you went uh, from not being in a film in a while to jumping into such a major role like that. Well, I've actually done some stuff that's probably not on IMDb. They're not the best at following up, and I really don't care that much about if people know what I do or not. Right. I, do, I do it for the work. You know what I mean? That's what I do. And so I've like stunt coordinated a couple things, and I've done some stunt stuff. And, but uh, obviously it didn't make it on there. I haven't even looked at IMDb, so... I wouldn't know, but at, at about that time, uh, I made the decision that I was really kind of over being in front of camera unless a friend called. You know, if a, if a friend is a director or producer or a stunt coordinator called and said, hey, we need you, we'd love to work. I've been focusing on writing and getting my stuff produced, and um, and I actually moved, you know, from Los Angeles to uh, back to South Carolina where I'm from, and, and I was just completely focused on getting my films done, and 
Sure enough, I get a call from a friend, Ron Hutchinson, the, 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 the stunt coordinator on the film, and the guy who coordinated the two Rob Zombie films. And um, so he called and said, hey, man, uh, we're doing another Halloween. I was like, awesome, man, awesome. And he goes, well, here's the deal. Um, I read the script, and I informed Malik and David Green that we need a guy who has really deep acting chops and is a really good stunt man. And by the way, David is very specific about the height, weight, and age of the mm -hmm. shape. So I fit that, and he, he, so when he told them, like, look, you need, this is what you need, and they're like, well, do you know a guy? And he goes, yeah, I happen to know a guy, Jimmy Courtney, and he's exactly what you need. So when I went down to the interview, um, it was in Charleston where we shot the film. Uh, I went down to be put on tape, and um, long interview, lots of movement, you know, lots of questions about, you know, uh, my experience and such. And, um, and then I hadn't even gotten out of the, uh, out of the interview and um, I was in the parking lot driving away from the, from the, the first audition, and um, I got a call from Blumhouse asking my availability. You know, would I be available to do the film? And due to having got to the, to the interstate, I got another call from Blumhouse saying that David Green wanted to meet me. Would I, you know, would I be able to come back? And so it was at that point in the game, as I understand it, and I could be wrong, but as I understand it, they didn't even look at anybody else. It was, it was done. Wow. That's an honor. That's really cool, actually. Yeah, it was like, you know, was, as the Arabs say, Maktoub. I mean, it's like it, it is written in, in, in the book of life. You know what I mean? It was just meant to be. Wow. Yeah. You, you mentioned that uh, David Gordon Green is looking for somebody a specific age and a specific height. And one of the, like, there was a joke going around for a long time on Twitter. Uh, people saying, like, wow, obviously Mike was played by somebody much younger. Uh, he's moving way too quickly to be somebody of what Nick Castle's age would be or what Michael's age would be. And then it's, it's you, and people don't realize that, that you just move extremely well for your age because uh, you are the actual age of Michael. I think you're 61, if, if I'm correct, which is the age of Michael. So, uh. Right. And that was, that was one of the questions on the panel at age 40, and, um, and you know, that's my answer. It's like, look, I, I, I train as hard as I did is when I was in college. I mean, I still train super hard. I, I'm in the shape I'm in. I'm in very much the same shape that I was in in my, my te late teens and 20s. Um, and if I can do it personally, why can't Michael Myers? What's right. the difference? Right. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I, I think it was just funny. People were complaining about it. It's like, he, there's no way that's a 60-year-old actor. It's like, well, it actually is. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's what I think, as I understand it, there was, and I don't know who it was, but it was one of the guys who played um, the shape in one of the previous incarnations of Halloween, and they contacted him, but they, then they realized that his body just couldn't hold up. I mean, this was it was it was a tough shoot, man. It was a brutal physical shoot, right? You yeah. know, I mean, it it, it, was, it's, it was definitely not for somebody who had bad knees or a bad back or you know, was right. not in shape. Yeah. Now you you did just say like how gruesome it was, and it is. It's pretty brutal. There's a lot of stuff going on that um, Michael had to endure. But you you had a stunt man. But I'm curious, like, how much stunts did you yourself do? Since you are trained in stunt and stunt stunt coordination. I did everything except a stair, stair fall, everything. Oh, wow. Every, every single thing. No, it, and, and, you know, honestly, I mean, I could have done that, but I was happy to have uh, a double on that because, uh, I mean, I was getting beat up anyhow, but um, a, stair, a stair fall is always painful. It's, you're always going to get a bone bruise somewhere. You're going to catch some part of your body that is not padded or not covered or, and it's, and, you know, for that, and I'm, and I'm, was happy to let somebody else get a day and, and have some fun. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's not worth the risk. Better play safe than sorry. But, that, I mean, even then, though, you still did a ton of work then. Um, and you're putting well, yourself at risk a lot. The, you know, and the, and the last scene, for the people who haven't seen it, I'm not going to say what it is. Right. But um, um, there, there was kind of this question of, well, there should be a double. And, and I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> First of all, you know, I mean, and, and it is, and it is a very dangerous stunt. And it is a, like a, a stunt that is measured in seconds as to how dangerous it is. And, and once, once, once it, you know, once it goes wrong, it goes wrong fast. Um, but that's my wheelhouse, man. That's, that's where I'm really fully alive because I'm so calm when I do those things. Um, so in that moment, there were there were a, uh, there was some talk about well maybe we'll use a double and I, for me I was going no man no not a freaking chance this is this is this is my character and my show and Christopher Nelson also weighed in and he goes no you, this mask was built to James Jude Courtney's face you can't put that mask on anybody else and put a camera on him 
you can't do it. So mm -hmm. that's another reason why every single scene was me. And even the scene that Nick Castle does, the one scene that he does, the cameo he comes in for, is the first scene when, he, when, when Laurie Stroud sees the shape. Right. That exact same scene, I do the second half of that scene where the stunt is because that was also a, a dangerous piece. I was like literally two inches away from the side of my head of, um, of what happened in the scene. And so that's not the kind of place you would put Nick Castle in. That's the kind of place you'd put a guy like me in that is used to that kind of thing. Right. Wow. I mean, so you, I mean, even yourself, you had a, some big shoes to fill uh, since Nick was coming back just for that one scene. But um, a lot of people struggle to match his movements uh, throughout the franchise. I think you did probably, I would argue, the best job since the original of actually matching what Nick's movement was uh, back 40 years ago. Did you study for the role? Because I know people like uh, Chris Duran didn't study at all. He just kind of did his own thing. I'm just curious if uh, if you studied Nick's movements or you just went in blind to that. I uh, before the audition, I watched the movie one time, and um, and really it was about not intellectualizing Nick's movement, not walking across the room or walking in the mirror or any of that. It really was about me reaching into to Nick's portrayal and grasping, like grabbing the energy. Um, so energetically, you know, allowing what Nick had created on a, um, you know, on, on, on like, on like really on a spiritual level, um, and allowing that to dictate how my body moves. So I put no intellectual thought into how I was going to move. Um, it was really, and there was a moment where watching the original, um, where Nick is walking as the shape in the back, in a backyard, literally like a two second shot and, and, um, you know, camera left to camera right, and uh, in my mind, I watched that, and I went, I got it. I, I, I got it. I grasped the energy, and that was it. And I never had to, I never thought about it again. I never, it was It was the place, and once it, once it got inside me, I knew it. I owned it. Yeah, I mean, you, obviously that worked, because I, I do think it's the most accurate portrayal since the original, so. Thank um, you. I, I think it's quite a compliment. Yeah. Um, now, one of the big things about this sequel that made it really special was the fact that Jamie Lee Curtis was returning, and of course, John Carpenter was back on board too, and Nick himself. Uh, what was it like working with all those, specifically Jamie Lee Curtis? I mean, uh, based on the final act of the film, which, like we said, we're not going to spoil anything, but you obviously are face to face with her a lot. You had to work with her a lot. I'm just curious what that was like, and I, I imagine you're probably a fan of her ahead of time, so I imagine that was pretty cool too. Oh man, yeah. I mean, she's iconic, and um, you know. And initially, I kept my distance from her. Um, I wanted her to feel comfortable um, in terms of the character she's creating. I didn't know her work process, so mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to like run up like, "Hey, what's up?" You know, like just be all <laughs> all chummy with her. I mean, so I, you know, I, I she introduced herself when she got on set, and then after that, I just kept my distance until I think probably a week in. She, we were opposite ends of the hair and makeup trailer, and um, she just got up, came over, and just started talking. And after that, it was it was uh, it was great. I mean, in terms of a personal, you know, uh, connection, um, man, I, I got to tell you, like in this this hashtag Me Too um, era, mm -hmm. uh, this is an empowered woman, dude. This woman is she's just. I mean, I use the term bad to the bone, and she is, man. She is just so. She's so intelligent and so witty, and so her, but her wit is self-deprecating and quirky. But she is fierce and does not suffer fools gladly. I mean, she's she's a remarkable human being. Yeah, I. It, it's so great to see her come back, not only uh, to help push that Me Too movement because this film does that very well. Um, and so it just landed a, a perfect time for that as well. But to, for her to come back to a franchise, especially a horror slash franchise, uh, it's just that's great to see as a horror fan in general. Yeah, yeah, it is, man. It is, and and you know the the at one point she and I were walking to set, and she goes, "Man, I am just so grateful for this." And I was like, "Tom, I'm living in second to second gratitude as well." I mean, and and the thing of it is, I mean, for her to be happy to be there was special. Every single person who worked on that show that I spoke with, and at some point I probably spoke with everybody, um, was grateful to be there. Was just totally stoked to be there, and everybody had a Halloween story. Everybody was influenced by the original on some way, some, at some point in their life. It was pretty incredible. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I am curious uh, because the I don't want to talk about the way the film ends, but it, it's uh, everyone, because of the freak amount of money this movie made, 
and it continues to make. They're already suggesting sequels. There's already been rumors about new writers coming in for that sequel. Are you interested in playing the part again if that does come about? Because uh, there's only I think George P. Wilbur is the only person to actually ever reprise the role twice. So it would be nice to see somebody we know back in the mask if that does happen. Yeah, I mean, you know, of course that's Malik Akkad's decision. But um, I, I, from my end, I couldn't imagine ever saying no to this. It, it was the most joyful and fulfilling experience of my career. And I've had some pretty cool moments in my career. So, you know, I've, I've been really lucky to be able to do what I do for a living. But, oh, my God, no, this, this, is, this is on so many levels um, a peak experience. And I would be honored to reprise this role. Well, that is uh, great to hear from a fan perspective, because uh, having you back it just makes it just one more thing to make it that much special. Like fans really do care, which is why Carpenter and Curtis and Cass coming back was great for the film as well. Yeah, 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 and and I'm really, you know, I, I'm really embracing the fans and their opinions, and you know, and, and it's really great. Like on social media, the the back and forth. No, this is better. No, I like that better. And you know, everybody has, <laughs> but they're, but it's great because they're entitled to this opinion. They've invested themselves in it. And I really, I find that really beautiful that so many people have invested in themselves in, in this franchise and, and so many have been so kind and receptive to this, to this iteration. Yeah. I mean, absolutely no doubt about it. It's, it's actually crazy to see how people's opinions on it and how different they are. But I think most people can agree that it, it, it does fit right in hand, hand in hand with, uh, with the original. So That was the idea. I mean, you know, when I read the script, I was, I was really kind of blown away. And, you know, I mean, Danny, you know, Danny McBride, Jeff Radley, and, and David did, a, I think, a beautiful job. Um, that being said, you know, when, when I got the first script, I read it. I, I, I was like, okay, I, I, I have a really strong idea of what this is going to be like. And... Uh, but after the second revision, I stopped reading the script because it was really about me being in the vibration of the shape and then letting David Green and Ron Hutchinson, the stunt coordinator, dictate the parameters of my of, of the scene. Like, okay, this is what you're going to do. And then there was very little, if any, someone telling me how to do something. Um, it was really just David going, okay, what I need is this and this. And then, you know, the cinematographer or the camera operators would be like, okay, this is where I need you or this is how we need to move. So it was all technical stuff that was given to me, but I was not given any um, any direction in terms of how to play the shape or how to do the things I did, which was really cool. It was really freeing. Yeah. Uh, now, I am, I'm also curious. I, I meant to bring this up earlier, but you – I don't know if you had to always wear it, but it seemed like a lot of the film you were wearing that prosthetic over your eye, which would – I imagine it blinded you in the left eye, but – Maybe not. Did that was that tough? One, what was the makeup process like? How long did it take every day to do that? And did it make it difficult to actually do some of the stunts and action you were had to do? Yeah, I did. Uh, as a matter of fact, and I was in makeup an hour every day, so I was in Chris Nelson's um, trailer. I mean, everyone, everyone, because that's the, you know it takes it to apply it, and then you know Chris is such a gifted, gifted, gifted guy. Um, so that's all airbrushing and, you know, so all the makeup is airbrushing and there's a lot, a lot of work that went into that. It, and it took me time, man, because, um, you know, like, we, especially when you're doing that, like walking downstairs, you know, every day I got better. And within a few days I had it, it was like, it was like, it was natural, um, because I wore it every single day and, and, um, you know, tracking, like when you fight, you know, I mean, you, you, you don't think about it, but you're tracking in, in 3D, you know, you, you're mm -hmm. tracking with perspective. So if you only have one eye to track, you know, a, a swing or, a, you know, um, it, it took me some getting used to, but once I got used to it, it's like, uh, it, it's like it always been that way. And I had, I had total depth perception as if I had two eyes. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, just, I think that's a lot of, one thing that people are overlooking is just how how difficult that would have been. I'm glad it came ended up becoming easier for you, but I, I couldn't imagine being blinded in one of my eyes and trying to do stunts, especially when you have to swing a knife around. I mean, obviously using a fake knife, but still, that's just there seems like a lot of risk there, especially when you're you're fighting around with Jamie Lee Curtis at the same time. Well, I mean, you think about it. You know, um, early on in the bathroom, again, I'm not going to spoil this for people who haven't seen it yet, but you know, the 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 in the bathroom scene, I mean, there is you know. Uh, that was early on. That, in fact, that was very early on, and so hmm. that was where I hadn't really locked in my death reception yet. Um, but you know, it worked fine. Um, there are other things that were shot where um, 
that didn't make it to film, that didn't make it to the final cut, but where there was a lot of precision uh, movement of that sort, you know, with uh, with um, with uh, instruments or movement and action and um, so you know. But you know, I, I have to say, man, there was years and years ago. I knew a guy who pitched for um, UCSD, University of California, San Diego. Uh, he had one eye; he was blind in one eye. Oh, and you know, so if it, and and I reasoned that, you know, when I and I remembered him, and it's like, so when when they informed me that that was going to be what I the condition I was going to be working under, I was like, dude, if he could be a college a D one college pitcher with one eye, I could certainly <laughs> do this with one. Eye. Right. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Always got to go with the right mindset. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I'm also, I just recently worked on a, a, actually a short fan film just for fun at, for Halloween that was just one shot. It was just a single take inspired very much off the single shot take or what seems like a single shot in the film, which we've seen, which has been in the trailers, um, which actually going to be more graphic in the film than we expected. But like, what was that like choreographing that out? Because ours is much more simplistic and was still unbelievably hard. And I could not imagine it to that scale that you guys did. Well, we, we spent a day rehearsing that. And even though we were rehearsing it, um, they thought they were going to have to stitch that together with CGI. Um, oh. But Stewie, uh, Stuart Cantrell, the Steadicam operator, is a very, very good athlete. And, you know, man, if you're an athlete, you know, once you... you when you're a t- when you have a teammate that you don't need to look like basketball, soccer, or whatever, you don't even have to look to see where your teammate is. You know, you can you, you can just toss it behind you. And you know exactly where that guy's going to be. You know exactly. Stewie and I had that. We developed that rapport. So um, after actually after we nailed it a few times, um, I think we did like nine takes, and we nailed it, man. We just freaking nailed it. And really, the adjustments were like. And they were difficult adjustments because they, there were no marks on the ground for us to use. We had to like do this by memory and hit really specific marks. And and some of them would be like, "Okay, we need you over exactly one inch," you know. And like, well, you're doing this very complicated shot. You've got no marks on the ground to tell you where an inch is. Somehow you got to remember it. Somehow Stewie and I had to keep that same proximity. And uh, and after we nailed, I think the ninth take, um, and I don't even know which take they used, but. Uh, David ran over and just gave me a big hug. He's like, "Dude, I, I just, I just, I, 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 I we just all knew we were gonna have to do, stitch it together, and there's no way you guys freaking nailed it." And it, it was awesome. It was freaking. That's what we live for, man. You know? Yeah, I honestly, that that's my favorite, probably my favorite kill in the entire film, uh, and it's just unbelievably well done. That, I think that's one of the things uh, that really holds up to bringing it back to the '70s, because there's not many people would need to be willing to accept that new things came in this film and that it is very modern on top of being old school. But that scene specifically feels so old school to me and it fits beautifully. Yeah. Thanks. It was, that was really, really fun. It's really fun to be challenged to that level. And I, and I very much enjoyed that kill as well. Was that the, uh, was that the most challenging thing? You're not, not technically at least, was that the most challenging thing in the film, uh, from the shoot? Hmm. You know, gosh, this is a really great question. Um, I, 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 there were a lot of, of physically challenging uh, moments, and there were a lot of um, confined spaces. There's a lot of, uh, you know, like uh, working with camera, working with, um, like the young actors were, um, you know, a babysitter. And, and uh, right. so, so there were a number of things that were challenging on a different level. But, you know, it's like, it's, I mean, that's, that's our wheelhouse. That's my wheelhouse. That's what we show up to do is be challenged creatively to make something look the way we want it to look. But you're always, in a film, you're always working with some sort of extreme or another. And this one was, I mean, just for instance, the opening scene in the courtyard, um, dude, it was like 29 degrees with whipping winds. And I'm wearing, you know, I mean, that was freaking (laughs) cold. And I stayed out there, man. I didn't go in. I didn't like. I didn't grow and get warm. I stayed out there between takes. I just wanted to be in that space, and I wanted to create that energy and just be in that energy. And so it, I'm, I'm, I actually was hocking up green shit for about a week because because I got sick, you know. But it was like, you know, and and you know, add to that, we're doing like 12, 14, 16 hour days. It was, yeah, it was insane. It was just we we got a lot done in a very short amount of time. Yeah, uh, 
you did you did just mention working with young actors, which made me think of Jabrail, uh, who played Julian, and he he stole the show in his did scenes. He? he was so <laughs> funny. I just like was he just as much fun to work with? I can't imagine the funny things he would have said off camera. He was he was awesome. He's like a seventy year old man in a little kid's body. <laughs> I mean, and, and like like a like a dirty Borscht Belt comedian kind of guy. You know what I mean? He's um, he's. He's a remarkable. I mean, that that kid's. That's the, see. That's the funny thing is the casting in this film. I think there's a lot of future stars in this film. He's one of them. Yeah. Certainly, Andy Matichek is one of them. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? Um, there, there was just a lot of talent that was drawn to this. There was a certain energy that made, and you know, and that goes back to you know to David and Malik and Ryan and all those guys. I mean, it's uh, yeah, but this uh, he was he was hysterical. I mean, and what's what's great about that is you know if, if some parents offended by those scenes, like dude, you better you better wake up because every kid that age knows that language, right? Well. Right. No, yeah, he was perfect. He was so natural. It's 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 always nerve wracking, even as an audience member, to watch someone that young work because a lot of times they don't pull off a very natural feel that kids are, and he killed it. It was just perfect. He, he did, man. And, you know, his dad was out there with him. And uh, his dad is a musician and a very talented guy himself. I think so. The apple didn't fall far from the tree there. I, I, I think and his dad is an exceptional man. So um, I, I, I think that um, – and it seems like he had a really great father-son relationship on the set with him. I mean, there was definitely um, – his father had control of the situation. His son was respectful, a really hard worker. I mean, really focused – you know, but his dad has had you know quite a degree of success in in, in his life, so I think it just sort of spilled over. Yeah. Uh, so okay, I have w- one last question. This one a bit off topic, but I always tend to ask a really open ended question and a difficult question for the last one. Since you now have, re- have played the role of Michael Myers, I'm really curious. Other than Michael, out of all the horror icons in history, if you could pick one to play, what would it be? Wow, man. <laughs> wow. Um, that's, you know, I don't know that I could be, I mean, you know, because the, I grew up on the classics, you know, on on the, the classic universal horror films. Mm-hmm. My dad and my brothers used to watch them, and they absolutely influenced me. Um, you know, I have to I don't know that I could pick one because I never because I haven't intellectualized this character because I just breathed him in and breathed him out mm-hmm. because I just lived it. Um, I think the it would make me go to a place of intellectualizing the difference between Michael Myers and and you know and Jason and uh, you know um, Freddy Krueger and you know and 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 Frankenstein and the Mummy and Dracula. Um, and I don't, I, and the space that I went to, to play this character is, is beyond 3d reality. It's, it's beyond duality. There's no right or wrong, good or bad. It just is. And it's, it was a very, very deep place. And I think if I were to start intellectualizing him, I would, I, I could lose touch with that place. So for me, I'm just embracing the energy of it. And I don't even somehow in some level, I don't even see it as anything the, the same as any other horror film. You know, I mean, for me, it's just a, it's out of time and space. Hmm. Well, that is a really interesting answer. <laughs> I always like asking questions like that because usually people always come up with really cool and creative answers like that instead of just uh, something simple. I do think you play a great Jason, though. I think you fit that body type perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, I mean, look, look at the guys who play Jason, you know, Robert Englund played, you know, Freddie. I mean, I mean, they're those characters were special i think because of the guys who played them mm-hmm. you know that they 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 brought something that was that was in its own way very deep and very polished and very special and um you know i think a lot of um you know like robert england and the and the the, the incredible work he did um with freddie and and i just know I, I don't know him personally but i consider that that a lot of that was just so intuitive you know, he just he locked in, and his intuition drove it. Just like Nick Castle's intuition created the shape. Yeah. You know. Yeah, some things are just meant to be, and it's how it yeah, worked it's out. Tr- it's <laughs> true. It's true, man. And uh, and I, 
I somehow, I, I, I won't be able to explain this, I'm sure, until I'm dead and gone, um, how this happened to me. But it was, you know, it was the, uh, it was the right time and place. And I, I will say, you know, when I moved back here to South Carolina, and I was, I mean, I mean and this is like out of, this is out of left field. Uh, but I've got a friend who's the most famous astrologer you'll never hear of. But he, because but he does his major corporations and politicians and CEOs and movie companies and directors and and he's he's definitely under radar. But he told me when I moved back here to South Carolina, which is on my Venus line, he, and I always I always take what he says with a grain of salt when he's always right. And I'm always like sometimes it really pisses me off. But um, <laughs> he told me when I moved back here, big things were going to happen, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. So I got back here to South Carolina and boom, this comes out of nowhere. And this is, you know, this is like, this is a game changer for me. Yeah. Well, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, who, who, who would know, you know what I mean? It's just, so I, like I said, I, it'll, it'll be when I'm dead and gone and I'm on the other side that I figure out what this all means, but it's been, it's just been an awesome ride and, and I'm really, I'm really, uh, you know, like I said, I'm living in gratitude and, and having a blast. It's exhausting right now, but it's, it's a blast. Yeah. Well, James, you've anything else you would like to say to the audience as in, uh, go see your movie. <laughs> yeah. Like dude, if you, I mean, and not just for me, I've got to say, you know, like go see it because, uh, for every female out there, go out and, 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 and check out what it means to see women, empowered women on the screen. You know, these are not, these are not set pieces, man. These women are, you know, they're, they're it's powerful. And, you know, for those of you who are fans of of, um, of Danny McBride, I mean, by all means, go see because you're going to see Danny McBride in that. You know, if you're fans of Eastbound and Down or Vice Principal or, or you know any other great work that Danny's done, I mean, th there's so many elements in there. If you're fans of uh, you know of, of uh, the work Christopher Nelson's done, I mean, he's won an Academy Award and Emmys, and this uh, this film offers so much. I think it's standalone. I think it can stand on mm. its own as a film in any genre. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's a brilliant piece of work, and not just because I'm in it. I was blessed enough to be a, a, a contributing factor in this, but you know, the, the scores of people who worked on this on every level were invested deeply, and I think everybody who goes to watch this will find will walk away thinking it was money well spent. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Definitely go check it out if you haven't already. I've seen it three times now, so I think I... <laughs> I think I got nice. it down. There's my contribution. <laughs> well, nice. <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. Uh, sorry it took so long to make it happen, but I think we did it on the perfect day, and I really yeah, appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, man. Funny how that works out, man. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked, man. Happy Halloween to everybody out there. Yeah.